Section 22 of The Catholic's Ready Answer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Catholic's Ready Answer by Rev. M. P. Hill. Section 22. Communion under one kind. Objection. The cup of the Lord is not to be denied to the lay people. For both the parts of the Lord's sacrament, by Christ's ordinance and commandment, ought to be ministered to all Christian men alike. 39 Articles of the Church of England. Article 20. The Answer. The Catholic Church would be the last institution in the world to deny the people anything in her gift that would conduce to their spiritual profit. If she gives the faithful the Eucharist, only under one kind, it is because she is obliged by circumstances to withhold the chalice from the laity. But at the same time, she neither infringes on any ordinance of Christ our Lord, nor deprives the faithful of any essential benefit which the sacraments was instituted to confer upon them. But what are these prohibitory circumstances? They are, in general, circumstances connected with the reverence do a sacrament in which our lord jesus christ is as really and as substantially present as he is in heaven at the right hand of the father if our non-catholic readers would appreciate to the full what we are going to say on the subject they must endeavor to realize that catholics sincerely believe that under the appearance of wine is present in the most real and literal sense the precious blood of our divine saviour if the contents of the chalice were given to the laity, they could not give, at least as a rule, in a manner consistent with reverence. Hence, the partaking of the chalice is permitted only to the priest during the holy sacrifice, which is offered in the name of both priest and people. As we shall see later, communicants are not thereby deprived of any essential benefit conferred by the sacrament. But what are the circumstances in question? Catholics certainly can easily imagine them. Fancy a parish of ten thousand souls for whose Sunday worship provision is made through six or eight masses, rapidly succeeding one another from dawn to midday. At each of these masses, when the signal is given, an army of communicants is seen approaching the altar rail. Time is precious, and Holy Communion must be given expeditiously though with decorum and according to fixed rubrics. Imagine a chalice, filled and refilled and filled again, out of some common receptacle on the altar, with constant danger to its precious contents, or at least to some small portion of them. The danger of accident, or of irreverence, increases, of course, with the number of communicants, among whom there are so many, whose oddity of manners makes it difficult to administer communion, even under the species of bread. Like enough, some portion of the sacred blood would remain unconsumed and would have to be preserved in the tabernacle amidst the other sacred vessels, which are used daily. How it would tax the priest's care to preserve that chalice with its contents from all manner of accident. In meantime, the sacred species would be growing vapid or sour. Furthermore, many of the communicants would have a natural aversion to the taste of wine. Others would not be able to retain it. Not a few would feel repulsion to drinking from the same cup as others, in some cases from a reasonable fear of infection. These apprehensions are not fancy bread. They are the fruit of the actual experience of the Church and the administration of the Eucharist under both kinds. They have been felt even in non-Catholic congregations, where they have been the subject of very serious discussion. An additional difficulty is experienced by some in our day arising from the fear that the use of wine in the communion service may beget the habit of intemperance. Leibniz, the distinguished philosopher and theologian of the 17th century, who labored long but unsuccessfully for the reconciliation of Protestantism and Catholicism, says of his own time, there are some Protestants who admit that if a person have a natural abhorrence of wine, he may be content with the communion of bread alone. 
System of Theology, page 121. Doubtless, some of the Protestant denominations of today would abolish their present practice if it were not for the fact that communion under one kind formed the subject matter of some of their original articles of protest against the Church of Rome. When the Reformers first came upon the scene, communion, under one kind, was in actual possession. Why did they abolish it? They retained so many other things which they had on the sole authority of the Church, and without a word of authorization in Scripture, that we ask with a natural curiosity and surprise why they did not retain communion under one kind, on the same authority. Leibniz reminds his co-religionists of their inconsistency. I have no doubt, he says, that those who are in authority have power to make laws in such matters as these, and that the faithful are bound rather to obey them than to give rise to a schism, which St. Augustine shows to be almost the greatest of all evils. Indeed, the Church's power of defining is very extensive, even, though this is only in a certain way, in things which belong to positive divine law, as appears from the transfer of the Sabbath to the Lord's day, the permission of blood and things strangled, the canon of the sacred books, the abrogation of immersion in baptism, and the impediments of matrimony, some of which Protestants themselves securely follow solely on the authority of the Church, which they despise in other things. Ibid, page 124. The abolished communion under one kind and gave the chalice to the laity. One of the principal reasons alleged for the change was that communion under both kinds was a matter of divine ordinance and commandment. But where do they find the ordinance and commandment? Surely not from the famous sixth chapter of St. John's Gospel, whose bearing on the Eucharist Protestants as a body will not acknowledge. For the sake of the comparative few who do acknowledge it, it let us remark that although in version 54 our Lord does say, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall not have life in you. A rigorous interpretation of the words in favor of the ultraquists logically require a like rigor in interpreting another verse a little lower down. He that eateth me, the same also shall live by me. Here the effect produced by the sacrament is promised to those who eat his flesh. The drinking of his blood is not mentioned. Surely, then, the substance of the ordinance, formal or implied, should be observed by receiving communion under the species of bread. But perhaps there is a general ordinance in the words, Do this in remembrance of me. But not even here is the practice enjoyed upon the faithful in general. The words are addressed to the apostles, and through them to the priests of the church, but not to the people. As the priests were to offer the sacrifice, and as this required the species of both wine and bread, both were to be consumed by the priest. The principle, indeed, the one essential reason why communion under one kind is deemed sufficient for the faithful at large is that Christ our Lord is present, whole and entire under the species of bread just as he is under the species of wine. There is not, nor can there be, any physical separation of the blood from the ever-living body of Christ. Consequently, Christ, whole and entire, must be present under either species, and as it is he that is our sacramental food and drink, we receive the whole of our spiritual nourishment by receiving the sacrament under the appearance of bread. So much for the Eucharist as a sacrament. As a sacrifice, on the other hand, both elements are necessary for the full significance of the sacrificial rite. Hence the apostles and their successors in the priesthood are obliged in the sacrifice of the Mass to consecrate both elements, and as the communion is an integral part of the Mass to receive both. Finally, the present practice of the Church has the sanction of ancient usage, although very naturally it was primitively the custom to give Holy Communion under both species. Still, there is abundant evidence of the fact that in the first centuries the faithful were allowed at times 
to receive under the species of bread alone. They were in some cases permitted to take the consecrated species home to their houses, to be there preserved and received. The sacred host was also sent to the prisons of the martyrs. Infants were also allowed to receive Holy Communion, but only under the species of wine, a custom still surviving in the Greek church. These facts of ancient usage are not denied, nor can they be denied, by any one who has even an imperfect acquaintance with early church history. One would suppose they were entirely unknown. So little impression do they make, even upon those who profess a reverence for the primitive practice of the Church of God. According to the opinion of the Protestant Leibniz, the question of communion under one species is a typical case in which authority is needed to decide what is of divine ordinance and what is a matter of ecclesiastical discipline. End of section 22